I'm about to do the intro. Get ready. It needs to be spontaneous. Yeah, I know. I have to act like I just walked in like some salon in Paris. And then you guys mm. are just sitting there smoking big fat cigars and then... We need, we need, to, we need to put the nice music in the background. And then I sit down on a nice velvet easy chair and uh, I cross my legs and you can see my extravagant socks above my leather Oxford shoes and then uh, start talking. It's basically like a, a vibe. Like, like a literature program on national TV. Yeah, I'm holding a notepad and a pen. You guys are faced one way and I'm faced another. <laughs> I'm a sailor in this, this scenario because I think it's, it's good. I have I, I dress like uh, Death Duck. It's, no, it's not Death Duck. Donald Duck. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> I, I don't I, I dress like Donald Duck and I'm a sailor. A duck? A death duck? No, Donald Duck. The, the Donald Disney duck. one. Oh, shit. Yes. I, I was trying to remember his name in English. But in Portuguese, it's the same thing. Pat Dorman. Yes. <laughs> like that. That's, all right, I yes. gotta put pants on. I gotta get in the right mindset. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I have pants on. I'm, I'm just kidding. All right. Okay, so... Pedro and Arthur. Right. Three, two, one. Hi, this is the fourth episode of A Tale Told by an Idiot podcast. And this time we're going to be talking a little bit about the American poet Hart Crane. And uh, today I'm here with Pedro and Arthur. Hi. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're going <laughs> to... Let's do that again. I don't know what happened, but it basically cut everything. I did not listen to a word after podcast. It cut everything. What? I don't. It's my connection, I think. But and they well, stopped laughing. Talking. So. You didn't have to hear it. What? Did Jacob hear it all? No, but but then you start <laughs> laughing, and then I say maybe he addressed <laughs> to me, and I did not say nothing, and he was laughing because of that. No, it's because. It's because Arthur gave a really laconic. <laughs> he said hi really laconically. And it was just. <laughs> okay, let's start again. <laughs> you are being negligent to watch him. Right, Don't sh- be sh- negligent. Should I, be okay, more, like... should I be more casual? Like, hey guys. <laughs> yeah, did, you <laughs> did you shake? Did you put your clothes into the dog? Because that was different. Oh my god. I'm going to give myself an asthma attack. Okay, let's start again. Okay, we got to get serious. Serious discussions. Yeah, serious literature discussions. We can't have any fun. This is is a no fun zone. We got to be like... We got to be like teachers at Yale or something. Yeah. Oh, okay, John Ashbury just died. Okay. Fuck. Uh, three. He died like <laughs> a month ago. No, he didn't. <laughs> Shut up, Sid. You, you're from Brazil, dude. You have a squeaky chair. Do you think? Okay. Okay, let's go. It's kind of it's, yeah. it's weird because John Ashbury died and I just started to become interested in him all of a sudden. Okay, so clearly <laughs> Arthur Hughes is John Ashbury. Oh, oh my shoot. god, why are we going to why are we going to talk we about should, Richard? We should do this story? podcast on John Ashbury instead. Well, but I've, I now, haven't read a single thing of John I have Ashbury. Like 12 layers or oh, five folks open about Hat Queen, so I have to get another <laughs> set up. <laughs> all right, I'm all right, ready. okay, uh, I'm going to start again. Okay, guys, get serious, quit laughing, this is ridiculous, okay. All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is the fourth episode of A Tale Told by an Idiot podcast, and this time we'll be talking about the American poet Hart Crane, and uh, today I'm with Pedro and Arthur. Hello. Hello. Arthur. Oh my god. (laughs) Dude, I can't. (laughs) I can't help it. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) 
<laughs> We're just gonna have to cut this out. I can't do the intro again. <laughs> All right. So, um, who wants to start talking about how they found Heart Crane? Um, well, I was in this uh, Skype group with some people from uh, Fortune Lit, and uh, these two guys that would talk about poetry a lot. One of the poets they mentioned was Heart Crane, and then a. Uh, so I had a uh, hard cranes collected poems in my e-reader, so I gave it a go, and that was that's, that was pretty much it. Well, I think I learned about hard crane when I was searching for English poetry like six years ago or something. But I tried to read him, and it was not really easy. And I was in my first time, which. English poetry, I, I came from a Portuguese back, background, and but after a year or so of reading, I start to go into more difficult poets, and eventually I began to read about half Crane, and, and that was about it. Yeah, for me, um, I really got interested in all the modernists at the same time. It was several years ago now, and... Um, I had been reading T.S. Eliot and then I kept hearing about Hart Crane because he's pretty, like his personality is pretty well known, even though he's really not read very much. And then I really started to get more seriously into him when I was hearing about Harold Bloom, because uh, I'm sure you guys know Harold Bloom really likes Hart Crane and talks about him. But um, I pretty much just got into his poetry by buying his collected poems, his complete poems published by Live Right. And I more or less started with White Buildings, read it straight through, and then I read uh, Most of the Bridge. And I didn't understand some of the poems in there, but um, his poems are actually pretty easy to read once you just get into his mindset and once you know a little bit about the time period in America and know what kind of things he references and yeah, and uh, that's pretty much how it started. Then I just went from there. Yeah. I think about difficulty. It's like Emily Dixon. When I was first hitting her, I had a lot of troubles because the language, how she shaped, she used it to, I don't know how to express it, but it, it's different from the usual poems you read in English, at least for me. And then with Hart Crane was kind of the same. I'm not sure if he his style could be compared with hers, but you know, I, I had that impression it was a, a little bit above the common constructions of poetry. I think. Or I think part of it is the um, the density because Emily Dickinson is fairly compact. You know, her poems are yes. usually pretty short. <laughs> And uh, it requires a lot of work of the imagination of the reader, which is not something that a lot of other poets really require usually. But that's why I think once you get you know, your mind around Hart Crane's poetry and you're used to using your imagination to read, it's, it really does become pretty easy, in my opinion. Yeah, so, yeah, I think I got that impression with her, her points, too. So this is why I came up with that. I but think... Uh, uh, I think Hart Crane is uh, really a, 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 a mystic of, well, uh, a poet trying to be a mystic of the early 20th century, much in the vein of Whitman for the first years of, the, uh, of America. Yeah, and I agree, I, because um, it just happened to be that I was reading Walt Whitman at the same time that I was trying to read Hart Crane, and... I had somewhat of the same feeling with Whitman. I, I felt like I didn't really understand his poetry when I first started reading it. And then pretty much I just waited. And then I could I felt like I just understood everything that he wrote. And something similar happened with Hart Crane. And um, Whitman was definitely a big influence for Hart Crane, at least. How he was trying to analyze his time period. His whole vision of... Uh, Optimism, optimism, optimism for the future based on the the current circumstances. The whole uh, work done uh, by uh, the average American that, uh, well, today is pretty much lost. But uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that might have been, that might have been uh, part of the reasons why uh, Hard Crane might have killed himself. He, yeah, I think it does contribute to it because he does have a quote where he's talking about Whitman and he's saying, if only I had an America like Whitman's to write about. He was really despairing that he felt like America had fallen in a way and Whitman had a a prime America to write his poetry about. And then by the time Hart Crane came around to writing poetry, America had become this capitalist decadence that um, nothing, people didn't truly care about anything. And it, um, he felt that writing had gotten less appreciated and things it's kind, like it's that. Kind of, it's kind of funny how a lot of people feel, feel it's just a, uh, that sort of feeling about uh, culture or society, they think it's a recent thing, but in yeah. reality, it's like it goes all the way back to even the beginning of the past century. Yes, is, is, isn't that some sort of selective bias? Because you know that movie, Wood Allen movie, Midnight in Paris, it deals with that subject. So I think it's a problem each time. But did not, didn't Hart Quinn think his writing at the end of his life was getting worse, like he was lost in losing inspiration and losing the quality of his Well, he did say that he thought he would never write something as good as The Bridge, but I don't think, I'm not sure if that was necessarily related to the quality of in individual works or just that nothing would reach the level of his epic poem. You know what I mean? Yeah, because the Broken Tower, written at the end of his life, is probably one of his best poems, at least in my opinion. And um, but I think, you know, it's just impossible to write something as a great as an epic poem if you compare singular lyrics. Uh, I think the whole thing about the bridge is that uh, it's it's really objective poetry if you think about it. I mean, objective in the sense that it doesn't, uh, I mean, Crane is not being, uh, talking about objects, giving them, uh, uh, you know, mystifying them, as Saad said, er, said earlier. This, uh, not much of the whole inward expression of feelings. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyhow, should we read as excerpts of, oh my god, I missed the word. <laughs> but shouldn't we read the bridge or parts of it? Um, now, yeah, we can read. Um, let's see. I guess I could just read the proem, the very first. You think that would be uh, good to start with? To Brooklyn Bridge. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah. that's actually one of my my favorite my favorite poems. Okay, so I'll start with that. The very one. first one. Okay, so this is the introductory poem to his epic poem, The Bridge, and this is to Brooklyn Bridge. And um, I guess I'll give a little background. Uh, he actually did live in an apartment that had an overview of the Brooklyn Bridge, and he later found out, this is after he had written his poem, the, the epic poem, but he did later find out that his apartment was actually the apartment that the architect of the Brooklyn Bridge stayed in, the architect and his family so they could overlook the, the bridge. But <clears throat> uh, this is the introductory poem. It's to Brooklyn Bridge. How many dawns chill from his rippling rest, the seagull's wings shall dip and pivot him, shedding white rings of tumult building high over the chained bay waters, liberty. Then with inviolate curve forsake our eyes as apparitional as sails that cross some page of figures to be filed away till elevators drop us from our day. I think of cinema's panoramic slights with multitudes bent towards some flashing scene never disclosed but hastened to again, foretold to other eyes on the same screen. And thee across the harbor silver paced as though the sun took step of thee yet left some motion ever unspent in thy stride, implicitly thy freedom staying thee. Out of some subway, scuttle, cell, or loft, a bedlamite speeds to thy parapets, tilting there momently 
shrill shirt ballooning, a jest falls from the speechless caravan. Dang. Down wall, from girder into street dune leaks, a rib tooth of skies acetylene. All afternoon, the cloud phone flown Derek's turn, thy cables breathe the North Atlantic still. And obscure as that heaven of the Jews, thy girdon accolade thou dost bestow. Of anonymity, time cannot raise, vibrant reprieve and pardon thou dost show. O harp and altar of the fury fused, how could mere toil align thy choiring strings? Terrific threshold of the prophet's pledge, prayer of pariah and the lover's cry. Again the traffic lights that skim thy swift, unfractioned idiom, immaculate sigh of stars, beating thy path, condensed eternity, and we have seen night lifted in thine arms. Under thy shadow, by the piers I waited, only in darkness is thy shadow clear. The city's fiery parcels all undone. Already snow submerges an iron year. O oh, sleepless as the river under thee, vaulting the sea, the prairie's dreaming sod. Unto us lowliest sometimes sweep, descend, and the curve ship lend a myth to God. <clears throat> well, as I was reading that, I just kept getting struck with the... Um, it feels very much like T.S. Eliot's poetry. I got that feeling. But, but uh, I don't know, I, I would say the the evocative power of, of the images is much more powerful, especially in the part where he describes a suicide jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge. That's probably my favorite uh, verse in that whole poem. I mean, yeah. just uh, so the description of suicide alone, it's like a, a jest falls off from your parapet. That, mm -hmm. that, that whole that whole line just resumes uh, a, a, the suicide's mindset, if you think about it. Yeah. The view. I really like the, the end of the poem, and of the curfew land that meets to God. What what is the what 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 just is he referring to like the act of suicide or existence in itself? I don't know. I think he's just talking about an individual. It, it's not really particular to anything. I guess. I I I truly don't think it is it pays. Me. I don't know. But I would not pay much attention. No, I, don't think, I don't think it's it's not praising. You don't you don't actually see in this poem if you think about it. I said this before, but uh, I'll say it again. It's pretty. It's a pretty objective description of a of a world outside the poet. The poet is describing his uh, how he views things in this uh, sort of mystical. Uh, mystifying uh, light. And it is somewhat interesting because um, that is definitely in contrast to the prose at the time that was being written. You know, if you think the 19-teens, 1920s, that's Proust, Joyce, Virginia Woolf, all their stream of consciousness, which is almost the exact opposite of uh, internal dialogue. But it does make me think a little of John Dos Passos, because in his trilogy, the USA trilogy that was written in the 1930s, which is just after Crane published his poem, it um, really speaks to like a documentary style, a very objective view of society and the individual. And I think that's an interesting contrast. I think that's a good point to make, the objectivity of the perception. Yes, and also when... Crane tried to, what Crane tried to achieve was kind of a mythical poem about America. And it's similar to the USA trilogy, so they shared that too. Yeah. And an interesting point, uh, I just read this in the biography, which is a very good biography. It's called The Broken Tower, by, written by Paul Mariani. He also does biographies of Wallace Stevens and Gerard Minley Hopkins and others. But uh, in the very end of the biography, just before... He talks about Hart Crane's death. He mentions that 
Um, Crane was reading the second book in the USA trilogy titled 1919, and uh, he said he read it so quickly that he was staying up late at night. He couldn't stop reading it because he enjoyed it so much. And uh, I can definitely tell that their sentiments aligned. Has <clears throat> there uh, been any uh, modern nation, well, poets in a modern nation besides America, you know, trying to uh, describe this, uh, this sort of epic about their, uh, their country? Well, Pessoa wrote uh, a book about the kind of the conquest of Portugal from the early days to modern times, and it was like a prophetic vision of what Portugal could be. And it, this is like early 20th century, right about the time Hart Queen was writing. So Portugal shares that. I don't know if Brazil has anything like this. We tried, we had in the 20s, in 22, the same year that a bunch of stuff was being published in, in Europe, Ulysses and and so on. And we had in Brazil a movement trying to capture the, the national uh, pride and a retreat to what was true, truly a Brazilian literature. But I, I think it's fair to... I don't think any of these movements managed to have success if they are a rosy in country because literature goes beyond that. And I don't think Hatskwain managed to, in, in, at least in the bridge, to do exactly what he wanted, although he was successful in, in some things, but I think it's a doubting task and it's not something to be, something that could be done. Do you understand what I'm trying to say or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing he was trying to do though, and the reason I mentioned T.S. Eliot, um, T.S. Eliot was quite a big influence. He was a little over 10 years older than Crane was, and he um, had been publishing stuff. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock came out in 1915, and that's when Crane was 16 years old. So um, Crane definitely had a quite a big influence from him, but The Wasteland came out in 1922, and um, Hart Crane's The Bridge is in some ways a critique of Eliot's view of uh, civilization and life in the wasteland, because... Um, Crane really tried to put out a more optimistic view of at least just uh, perspective on the world compared to how T.S. Eliot portrayed it in The Wasteland. And in some ways you could say Hart Crane failed. Maybe he um, had begun to lose faith in his earlier optimism as he got older and as he wrote more. But I would say at least from myself reading both, I prefer the sentiments of Hart Crane's poem, although they're both, you know, top level craftsmanship. So, but for, for some reason, uh, T. S. Eliot kind of eclipses uh, Hart Crane if we're talking about a uh, international influence. Yeah, I like, think it's partially because, you know, of course he lived longer, and then he was also a uh, an editor for Faber and Faber, so a lot of people had to. Butt kiss, try to get published. Yeah, also, he was Europe, with right? Ezra Pound. Yeah, he yes. lived in the UK, so. So, yeah. Ezra Pound, Yeats, and Joyce, everything was happening at Europe at the time, so yeah. it was much easier to get your literary career if you were from Europe. Yeah, if you, was you would okay. have. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't Crane like send uh, one of his manuscripts to Ezra Pound and get rejected? Uh, I don't know exactly. Um, I know that he first published The Bridge. It was actually from uh, Harry Crosby, who had basically a vanity press. He was the nephew of J.P. Morgan, you know, that huge banker investor that was one of the richest men in the world at the time. But um, Harry Crosby started a vanity press and published The Bridge. It was in Paris that they had this press. And he invited Hart Crane out to uh, France so they could meet. And um, that's actually the first time that Walker Evans had the, the... It's actually the same photo 
that's on the complete palms of Hart Crane. They used that same photo back in the day, Walker Evans, that photo off the Brooklyn Bridge. I, th- I always thought that was really neat. And Harry Crosby himself lived a very interesting life. He ended up committing suicide, I think, in his uh, late 20s. So interesting how that happens. It, happen- it happens mostly with uh, poets. Yeah. Well, no, not suicide specifically, but like dying at a really young age. Yeah, it does seem more common for one reason or another. Um, well, I think... On the, I, well, go ahead, go ahead. No, keep going. I was going to talk about the other thing. Well, I was just going to say, if if there was a moment of break, I could just read one of his earlier poems. I was thinking about reading Chaplin-esque, but if you're going to talk about something related to what we were talking about... Yes, yes, it was ahead. related, because... You know how you talk about how we talk about how poets uh, are to b- brought that up about suicide and such. And there is a quote by Harold Bloom on, on the anatomy of influence. He says, we all fear loneliness, madness, dying. Shakespeare and Walt Whitman, Leopard and Hart Crane will not cure those fears. And yet these poets bring us fire and light. And I think this is important because it's like a glimpse of fire and light you get when you are reading, but it does not solve anything. That is, we have much deeper problems to be solved by literature. I don't think they can be solved at all, but they can bring us fire and light. Bring, yeah, it also bring. may be that those problems are unsolvable, at least through language. And then bring that's water. one of the bring. only tools we have to solve problems. Kind of like, I don't, I don't really believe in the in the Bloomian view of poetry, like, oh, po- poetry's like uh, uh, s- steaming with life, it, uh, it's water, it gives us hope. I don't think uh, poetry can actually do that, to be honest. Well, I don't know. I think it can give us a good, maybe not necessarily reason to live or anything, but it, it helps. Like, literature can, are you trying to say it? It is a moot point to read poetry if you are trying to achieve a sort of solace or, or consolation or anything like that. I, I do think that trying to connect with other people, even if you do not know them, but through writing, you you get by. It will help. I, I don't think it will be neutral when, when, uh, at all. It will help. Yeah, I've always thought it was interesting. I can't remember if this was from... Uh, I was reading T.S. Eliot's um, like the collected works, and there was uh, quite well, heavy. Well, it, it uh, can it can help, but as you can see with the example of many poets, hard creating included, it can also destroy you. So uh, it's a it's double edged sword. Yeah, but as far as the um, like the function of literature, uh, I'm pretty sure this was from the an editorial thing in T. S. Eliot's collected poems, but. Um, even if it wasn't, it, it makes sense. He, uh, whoever it was was talking about the reason they wrote poetry and um, one of the main reasons to do it is as a communication between uh, one person to another. And uh, that alone, I think, salvages poetry from whatever uh, bad thing you can yes. say about it. That was also Frank O'Hara in taking of poetry. From the manifesto uh, personism, it was of course half ironical, but but it, it did not make it less true that part at least. I think I'm going to read um, one of Hart Crane's poems, and I think it uh, touches on these themes. It's called Chaplinesque. It was written somewhat early in his poetry career in his early twenties. And before I read it, I'll just say a little anecdote that's kind of interesting. He was friends with a guy named uh, Waldo Frank, and Waldo Frank was a little older and um, like pretty much accepted in the New York literary scene at the time. And uh, Waldo Frank actually was friends with Charlie Chaplin. And one day, Crane was just in his apartment doing nothing really special, and wearing his pajamas and then he hears a knock at the door and he opens it 
and it's his buddy Waldo Frank with Charlie Chaplin standing there. And this is in the like mid 1920s. So by this time, Charlie Chaplin is already huge and world famous, the most famous actor in America, at least. And uh, all they just spend the rest of the night going out, getting drinks, uh, getting dinner. I think they stayed out until something like 4 a.m. and they brought Crane back to his home and then Chaplin just drove off and that was how he met <laughs> Charlie Chaplin, the most famous actor at the time, making huge amounts of money. But he had actually written this poem uh, before he met Charlie Chaplin and uh, yeah, it's called just, Chaplin uh, They just huh? went out for drinks and they ate. Yeah, basically they just talked. Uh, they just had discussions for six hours, eight hours, something like that. And then he later met up with Waldo Frank more, but I don't think him and Hart Crane ever met again. I, I couldn't say for a fact, but... And nothing else happened. <laughs> All right, and this is Chaplin-esque. We make our meek adjustments, contented with such random consolations as the wind deposits in slithered and to ample pockets. For we can still love the world who find a famished kitten on the step and no recesses for it from the fury of the street or warm, torn elbow coverts. We will sidestep and to the final smirk dally the doom of that inevitable thumb that slowly chafes its puckered index towards us, facing the dull squint with what innocence and what surprise. And yet these fine collapses are not lies, more than the pirouettes of any pliant cane. Our obsequies are, in a way, no enterprise. We can evade you and all else but the heart. What blame to us if the heart live on? The game enforces smirks, but we have seen the moon in lonely alleys make a grail of laughter of an empty ash can, and through all sound of gaiety and quest have heard a kitten in the wilderness. I think wow. that poem really gets to the themes of his work. The, the game enforces smirks, but uh, we can still love the world, even though it Threatens treat itself. Us, treat us so badly. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, I, th I think there was uh, somewhat of a change in white buildings. It's uh, we see a a lot more inner expression that we saw in the bridge, but uh, it's sort of like he kind of sprays his uh, inner subjectivity into the to the world outside him and uh, I, I, li I like his uh, instead of saying uh, I he brings his uh, a we maybe to yeah that is a good point he's uh, it's, it's using his uh, subject subjectivity of a poet to uh, speak to a uh, maybe the whole of society or mankind or basically just a, a whole array of, of uh, personalities that uh, sh despite their backgrounds or uh, upbringing share his same uh, sentiment mm -hmm. his same feeling kind of like the same the same about uh, Neruda in his poems and also, um, in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, I've just had that on my mind recently. Of course, it starts, uh, let us go then you and I, which is somewhat of a direction it's towards the reader, inviting the reader, you know, as Hardcrane says with we. It's, uh, I think that's involves. kind of like uh, the whole change in the lyrical expression, the most radical change in the 20th century, it's like the inclusion of a, of someone else, a you. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you like, go far back into like the Renaissance and stuff, uh, and the whole uh, patriarchism was the main uh, dominant form of lyrical poetry and patriarchism Patriarchism is basically a, an individual expression, an, an individual expressing his own, uh, his own uh, tortured subjectivity without any 
and the uh, uh, without directing himself to to the to anyone else. Well, except like for the the loved uh, lady, but, but uh, it's, it certainly does not a uh, does not a uh, direct itself at the reader. It's yeah, not, uh, I suppose that had uh, inklings in naturalism that was really big in you know the late eighteen hundreds, and then uh, I I've always appreciated modernism for its combination of naturalism that, you know, like as you were saying that sort of a determinist type of view of the world, but then also the the focus on how individuals still have to do things <laughs> in a world that may be determinist. So that combination of maybe more democratic tendencies of artwork and then uh, objective descriptions of the world, uh, all that combining, I think, really makes modernist literature one of the best for me, at least one of the ones I appreciate the most. Uh, I think I'll say one more thing about Hard Crane. There, there's this good book out that's called uh, "Oh My Land, My Friends." It's the selected letters of Hart Crane, and uh, it's edited by Langdon Hammer and Brom Weber. It is a really good collection of his letters, and it's really interesting how early he starts out knowing he was going to do poetry. Uh, it, it's as early as when he was 15, 16, and living in Ohio. He would write to his friends or even when he went to New York when he was 18 writing to his dad saying if only if only I had enough free time I, I'll become one of the best poets in America of my generation and um, a lot of people say like John Keats letters his letters are really prized for their uh, ability at literary criticism and I just figured I'd mention that because um, you can find it pretty cheap, and it's it's a really good introduction if you want to imagine how he was thinking at the time. I'd say it's even better than a biography, really, to try to feel out his personality. And what about that movie that James Franco did, the book based on that biography, The Broken Tower? Yeah, it, uh, I haven't seen it personally, but The Broken Tower, it's like 450 pages, and... Um, I would be willing to bet a million dollars that uh, the book is significantly better than his movie. But I'm sure well, if someone's really interested in Hard Crane, I'm sure it would be interesting to watch. But. but books and movies are different mediums. Of course, it will be different. I don't know. I did not watch well, the, uh, the movie, nor uh, read the biography, yes. but I, I wanted to bring yes, it. James anyone Franco. has information. I mean, I know that James Franco's adaptions of Faulkner are horrible, so I can only imagine that <laughs> his adaption of a biography would be the same. But, I mean, it probably, if you have free time instead of watching vlogs on YouTube, it'd probably be better than that. Yeah, it's better than watching or a podcast, you know? <laughs> yeah, listening to a podcast between three dingbats who don't know anything. Maybe better. <laughs> All right, so um, in 1932, uh, Hart Crane is uh, 32 years old in the beginning of the year, and at this point, he has been living in Mexico for a little while, and he's actually been living with a woman, Peggy Cowley, and uh, in, I believe it was March, not 100% sure, April, early in the year, uh, they went on a ship leaving Veracruz back up to America. And um, at this point, Hart Crane had been fairly down. He had already published The Bridge. He felt that his poetry that he had been writing since was not up to the standard. Um, and as he was on the ship going back to America, they stopped at a port city that um, Crane and uh, Peggy had visited before, so they made an appointment, you know, hey, let's have dinner. And so Peggy went out, did some shopping, bought some records for Crane as a surprise. And uh, Crane went out, um, enjoyed himself, mailed off some postcards. And later in the day, Crane went to a restaurant, uh, Peggy went to a different restaurant, and they both assumed that the other one had been mistaken. So Crane started panicking first, went back to the ship, started uh, thinking something may have happened to Peggy. Peggy went back on the ship, and before they found each other, 
Peggy had uh, tried to light a cigarette and the box of matches exploded in her hand. So she went to the uh, doctor on board and that's where Crane found her. And he started to you know, berate her. Where were you at? I thought something happened to you. Why weren't you there at the restaurant? He kept mentioning that she went to the wrong one and he was at the correct one. And uh, he was getting, um, at this point, the doctor was working on Peggy, had been giving her some sedatives because her hand was bothering her. And um, she was telling Crane to leave her alone, basically. And after a while, the doctor also agreed that it had gone too far. So the doctor got someone to lead Crane away. And he was actually protesting so much that they locked him in his room and nailed the door shut. But... By around midnight that that night, he had broken out of his room and tried to get back to Peggy. And by the time he got there, she was uh, under morphine from her hand. And she told him to leave her alone again. Because at that point, he had been drinking. So, um, subsequently after that, no one really knows exactly what happened, but... Um, he eventually ended up getting beaten up by sailors. They think he went to their quarters and had solicited uh, something, and he was found with a black eye, a bloody nose, and wandering around the ship at night, drunk. And later that morning, when Peggy had woken up, some of the drugs had worn off, she was in a much better mood, and Crane was saying that this is it. He, he had finally disgraced himself, and he, he said he wasn't going to be able to make it. And she was saying, don't be silly, you know, we'll just have a nice breakfast. So they ate breakfast together, and um, then Peggy went to uh, clean herself up. She was feeling better. And Crane went out for a walk around the ship with his pajamas and a light coat on. And I think it was around 10 a.m. that day that someone, they had a meeting on the ship about some pool game, saying the final scores, and some lady on the ship saw that Crane was standing on the rail and had folded his jacket and laid it across the rail. And she kind of thought it was unusual how he was positioned on the rail. And um, she saw him grab the rail and go on his tiptoes. And she thought that was really unusual. So she started paying attention to him. And then some other people in the group started to look over. And that's when he jumped over the railing into the water. And uh, the lady that had been given this account said that he started swimming uh, vigorously but uh, after that, he disappeared from the water. They sounded the alarm for a man overboard. They sent down four lifeboats to try to find him. And they spent th over three hours looking for him. And then uh, after not finding him, the, the captain finally decided it was, um, it was too late. So they continued their trip on. And um, so he ended up drowning in the river or drowning in the Gulf of Mexico that uh, was such a large theme in his works in the bridge he frequently talks about it and as Arthur mentioned earlier the um, the bedlamite with the ballooning uh, shirt jumping the last uh, the jest and uh, in his it's voyages good. poems he talks about the the duality of the sea how it somewhat resembles a woman as in life-giving but it also is very dark yes at the the end of the first part of voyage he says the bottom of the sea is cruel and then the second part he starts with and yet this great wink of eternity of ringless yeah. floods and he goes on also on on the Mel at Melville's tomb he he talks about the sea too. yeah and he also talks about death in it too where uh, you know Melville had been dead for a while at that point. Yeah. 